Hello, welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute or two. Hello, everyone. I'm going to give folks maybe one more minute to join in. All right, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to our webinar, Financing Climate Smart Agriculture, uh, in which we're gonna display a collaboration between Environmental Defense Fund and Farmers Business Network on an exciting new loan product. Um, just a little housekeeping to get us started. Uh, we're gonna have a question and answer session at the end. So please enter your questions into the Q&A box, um, not the chat the Q&A box um, and we'll check those after the presentation um, and answer as many of them as we can. All right, so um, thanks again for coming. Uh, your speakers today are me, um, I'm Maggie Monis. I'm Senior Director on Environmental Defense Fund's Climate Smart Agriculture team um, and I lead our agriculture finance and markets work. We're also joined by Steele Lorenz, who's head of sustainable business for Farmers Business Network, and Shelby Shelton, who's a manager on our Climate Smart Agriculture team, um, has a great background in soil science and works closely with our scientists um, on the robust environmental standards that underpin this project. So I wanted to start with some of the big picture um, issues and trends uh, that I think this collaboration plugs into in a really interesting way. So, um, you know, as many of you I'm sure are following, they're increasingly being uh, net zero greenhouse gas commitments being set by major food and agric agriculture companies, as well as major financial institutions that have a food and agriculture portfolio. Um, and yet at the same time, agriculture is a particularly challenging sector to decarbonize um, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, you know, lots of smaller landowners doing disaggregated activities, uh, a lack of data um, at the, you know, the company or the finance provider level to really gain insight into how different farm management practices impact emissions and how they can be reduced. Um, and then, you know, a variety of unaligned incentives. So the farmer isn't necessarily getting a clear message or all the support that he or she needs to shift to practices that better support them um, in implementing climate smart agricultural uh, management. Um, on that note about the different incentives, I did wanna bring your attention to um, a new report that uh, we launched alongside Field to Market earlier this week. Um, and uh, so there's gonna be another webinar next week uh, if you're interested in that. And at the very end of this presentation, I'll have that link as well. Um, and that goes through 12 different strategies uh, to incentivize climate smart agriculture. Um, and so this uh, loan product that we're gonna talk about today is one of those that's included in the report. Um, and I'm thrilled to give you a really close look at how this one works um, and what we're hoping to learn from this uh, pilot loan product. Um, and so, you know, really 
as you can see, there are kind of two key issues here that we're going to be going into more depth and show how this pilot interacts with them. You know, one is how can financial institutions that serve agriculture really understand the emissions of their portfolios um, and get down to the farm level and understand how to improve those emission profiles. Um, and then the flip side, of course, is how you finance improvements in, 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 um, in emissions so that you can achieve the kind of targets uh, that our planet needs. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard there's lots of investor interest in um, climate smart agriculture and yet a lack of investable opportunities. At the same time, there's lots of, you know, farmer talk about um, you know, different incentives. And yet, um, I think in general, farmers are not yet seeing really at scale the deployment of those incentives. So, you know, as we start to think about areas for really high on the ground impact, I want to highlight one particular environmental opportunity. Um, and this presentation is really focused on, um, you know, the climate side, the emission side, for those of you who are familiar with our work, we also do a lot of work on the, on the resilience side, how farmers can build resilience to climate impacts. Um, and you know, what's great is that those two opportunities can often go hand in hand. But when we really look at the emissions side, um, agriculture only emits about 10% of total US greenhouse gas emissions, but um, disproportionately high percentages of really potent greenhouse gases like methane, and nitrous oxide. So you can see from the, the chart from the EPA on the right, um, agricultural emits 75% of nitrous oxide, which uh, is a greenhouse gas that is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So there's a very big um, bang for your climate buck in opportunities to reduce nitrous oxide. Um, as, and this really comes down to, you know, as the chart says, agricultural soil management but in particular, nitrogen management. And so management of the nitrogen fertilizer and manure that nourish the crops, but when used in excess, can contribute both to water quality pro problems and to nitrous oxide. Um, so, you know, another key question as we think about this environmental challenge um, is, well, you know, what does this mean in terms of the farm level finances? Um, and how can we make this work for farmers? Um, and this is a, an area that EDF has spent a lot of time digging into, no pun intended, um, and really was brought to us by some of our own farmer advisors um, five or more years ago when they wanted to better understand the financial impacts of the climate smart agricultural practices that they were implementing. Um, and so, you know, we got in there with uh, agricultural accountants, um, the farmers themselves and other partners to really try to analyze at the farm budget level, you know, what does this mean in terms of farm finances? And we looked at practices like um, efficient input use, efficient fertilizer use, cover crops, no-till, diverse crop rotations. Um, and what we found is that at the farm level, these practices, you know, can reduce farm costs and can also reduce farm risk. But it really takes strong management, both strong operational and agronomic management and strong financial management. Um, and lots of those benefits are found in the interactions between the practices. For example, when you add in a cover crop, then over time dialing back your nitrogen use. Um, and so, you know, it can't be ignored that there are real costs for farmers to implement the suite of practices. And while there are benefits, you know, it takes work for farmers to really achieve those benefits um, and, and prove them out through their management and in their budgets. Um, so I won't also wanted to, so the report on the left is just one of uh, a number of reports that we've done on these uh, economic factors uh, on the farm. And then I also wanted to show you this um, uh, chart from some survey work that we did with 100 Iowa farmers looking at um, both their perceptions of soil health and related agronomic practices, as well as their interests in farm lending products that would support them in adopting these practices. Um, and so as you can see, you know, farmers' perceptions in this survey really aligned with, with what we've seen in the farm level data. 
Um, they believe that these practices improve the environment, improve crop yields, increase long-term profitability, um, but there are still costs. Um, and you can see that you know, short-term profitability, far fewer of them were confident that there were benefits there. Um, we're now expanding that work through collaboration with a lot of the um, land grant farm financial databases like the University of Minnesota and Kansas State and working to really bring this data to scale and try to connect farm financial data, both with climate data as weather is becoming more variable, as well as with practice data to really understand the financial impacts of different practices. Um, now, as we are trying to build this out on the farm level, you know what we see through a lot of the work that we do with agricultural lenders is that they just don't have this level of visibility. Um, you know, if climate smart agriculture really is lower risk on the farm, that should also mean that, um, you know, farm, farms loans should also be lower risk as lenders are, you know, close financial partners to farmers, those benefits should transfer through. But lenders just don't have that kind of insight to the data, either on the environmental impacts or on the financial impacts of these practices. So there's a real challenge in proving that out. Um, and creating lending products that recognize that value that's generated and rewarding that to the farmer. So this is our big question is, you know, we've got increasing evidence that climate smart agriculture is beneficial for farmers, but how does this impact uh, farm loans and lenders portfolios? So I'm going to hand it over to Steele now to talk about how our pilot can help fit, fit into that gap. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. So um, just to outline the, the program that we've launched, uh, and then I will also give a little bit more background on, on FBN and, and uh, the role that we play here. Uh, but the uh, pilot here uh, is a $25 million uh, operating loan uh, fund. Um, we anticipate that uh, that will be um, about 30 to 40 growers uh, when it all is said and done. Um, and uh, the expectation is that uh, or the, the um, growers will meet the environmental standard as uh, has been set out by uh, EDF, uh, which Shelby will talk about a little bit later in this presentation as well. Uh, and then they will qualify for a half a percent uh, or 0.5% uh, uh, rebate on the, on the loan. Um, FBN is providing uh, both the uh, loan origination services uh, through our finance division uh, and, and servicing, as well as the uh, MRV services through our gradable platform. Uh, so being able to uh, help uh, understand uh, what's going on in the field and make sure the growers are, are indeed qualified. Um, you can hit the next slide. So. Um, the timing of the loan, uh, for those of you that are familiar, the, the typical operating loan season is uh, November, beginning of November to the end of February uh, in terms of uh, being able to sell that product in. Um, we are running our own eligibility. Um, the, the cutoff will be uh, the end of um, February, although uh, given the outsized demand uh, from growers in our network today, uh, it's likely that 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 fund will close much sooner uh, than that. Um, when we do the uh, initial evaluation, um, uh, we do a credit application uh, review, and then we also do an environmental uh, application review. Um, that is um, uh, run by my team. It takes about uh, 20 minutes, so it's relatively painless for a grower to go through. Um, and they do it uh, in parallel uh, when they're doing their, their credit review. Um, they then, uh, you'll go through uh, the uh, planting season. Uh, the, the loan uh, as, it, as designed in the pilot is currently one year. So uh, payback uh, is due uh, February, March timeframe. Um, we would like to be able to expand this in the future to be multiple years. However, for the pilot phase, it's just one year. Um, additionally, the structure of this program is that uh, this is a uh, rebate. Uh, so uh, you sign up for your loan and you, you uh, pay it in full. And then uh, after we have received confirmation that uh, you did in fact meet the environmental criteria, uh, then you will get a, a rebate back on this program uh, sometime in March or April uh, after we've been able to collect uh, that final um, environmental data. Uh, next slide, please. So just a brief on, on FBN, uh, we got our start as a agriculture a technology platform that allowed growers to share information, uh, both agronomic and economic, uh, in order for them to be able to 
anonymously um, and to find areas for improvement. Um, and a lot of that was focused on uh, efficiency, uh, but we found pretty quickly that there were um, the same uh, things that growers were working on or similar things that growers were working on to optimize efficiency. Uh, we're also really critical to minimizing greenhouse gas emission uh, in working lands. And so um, that platform has grown substantially since we started. Uh, we now have about 35,000 growers uh, across the US, Canada, and Australia, uh, representing uh, over 70 million acres. Um, you can hit the next slide. So uh, the process for us to run uh, any of our environmental programs, whether it be our the Regen Finance Fund or uh, whether it be a supply chain program that's providing premiums for hitting environmental standards, uh, is that uh, growers are sold uh, in um, uh, explicitly uh, for the opportunity to be use uh, some of their data uh, as uh, a proof that they are hitting environmental standards. Uh, I, I make a, a point of, of saying that and being explicit there because um, no growers are auto opted into anything um, and certainly not uh, when their their information is um, uh, may be used or, or may be uh, verified by a third party. So um, growers are opting into this program. Uh, then FBN uh, does the data collection. Uh, we do scoring and quantification, and, and uh, we provide uh, assistance in, in verification and validation. Uh, finally, we do aggregate reporting on, on all this, both uh, back to the grower to help them understand areas for they, they can improve, as well as uh, to, in this case, the uh, funds to help them understand uh, where their fields landed in, in terms of environmental impact and where the biggest opportunities are for improvement. Um, can you get the next slide? Uh, this is the data that we are uh, collecting uh, for this program and for almost all uh, programs. Uh, rather than go through everything here, I will say that um, we have a, a complete picture of production information um, at the field and subfield level. Um, and that allows us uh, to be able to be very confident in um, uh, where these practices are being deployed um, and, and uh, what the true context is for those, uh, for those practices. Uh, the only thing that I'll call out here that um, is not uh, in, in part of all of our programs, and we do do for some uh, uh, some uh, programs that require it, is uh, we include soil sampling. Um, so uh, there is a requirement here that um, uh, soil sampling or nutrition um, plans must be driven by soil sampling, but we're not collecting the soil samples ourselves. So um, next slide, please. So here's an example of the uh, information that we provide back to growers as a part of participation in the FBN platform um, that helps to uh, both align conservation uh, outcomes with um, uh, ROI outcomes uh, and will be uh, crucial to uh, growers being um, making uh, agronomic and economic decisions uh, as part of this program and, and really other sustainability programs in the future. So uh, what you are looking at is our um, a yield potential tool uh, for uh, this specific um, uh, instance. It is uh, looking at 5,000 varieties of corn um, and uh, looking across, it's not using model-based outcomes, but instead looking at uh, the data that has been provided to us through our, our FBN network. Uh, to be able to make a recommendation for what will be yield maximizing or ROI maximizing for uh, not just you know your county but your specific field your field boundaries. Um, so what that uh, we have seen is that uh, we typically see an opportunity for growers to uh, improve yield by somewhere between five and ten percent uh, by optimizing seed selection uh, without uh, increasing inputs. Um, said another way, uh, that is a, a huge opportunity to increase uh, productivity, to uh, decrease uh, carbon intensity per bushel output um, based on uh, looking at uh, uh, a business decision that growers make consistently. Uh, why FBN is really excited about uh, the Regenerative Ag Finance Fund and other sustainability programs that we run is that it further helps us um, uh, or, and helps our growers uh, focus on making uh, efficient decisions that drive both uh, improvements in the field uh, and, and uh, return on investment. So uh, it is another uh, incentive to be able to look at uh, the, these elements of their business. Um, can you hit the next slide? Um, this is a preview of a, a, um, a nitrogen planning tool, a uh, fertilization planning tool that we will be rolling out um, in March or April of this year. Um, this is specifically to help growers uh, uh, meet that end balance requirement, um, and it is based on uh, MRTN uh, University nitrogen 
question recommendations. Um, we have some really interesting uh, work uh, on, uh, that a uh, part of our data science team did that suggests that uh, precision nitrogen application is really important, but what would make the biggest difference uh, is being able to uh, have uh, incentives for growers to be uh, applying just that uh, uh, nitrogen uh, yield maximizing number uh, and, and not over applying uh, from that standpoint. So um, the Regenerative Ag Finance Fund is part of an incentive uh, to look at that. Uh, the fertilizer plan um, uh, automated tool is uh, to guide and assist growers who want to be able to make changes. Uh, and I will um, say anecdotally, uh, we already have requests coming in from growers who are not just, um, uh, who don't just fit the profile and, and uh, qualify for the environmental protocol today. Uh, they are asking us uh, explicitly for help on how they can uh, qualify for the program in the future, which is the entire uh, intent and hope uh, of this program. Of course, you never know uh, exactly how motivating it will be, but uh, I can tell you again, uh, early signs that uh, point to uh, it being very influential in, in grabbing growers' attention and having mindshare and looking at and using these tools in, in order to uh, help improve their environmental outcomes. Can you hit the next slide? Um, I, I, will, I will briefly mention uh, um, some of the work that we do from remote sensing standpoint. Um, so for uh, uh, practices that are um, uh, that are visible uh, from remote sensing, uh, we have built systems to be able to add uh, credibility into the claims that our growers are making. Uh, uh, the vast majority of information that we rely on is uh, collected by machine data or uh, reported uh, through commercial receipts or, or survey data. Uh, but we work to uh, triangulate those claims and understand um, uh, essentially uh, from multiple different sources that that indeed uh, that practice or, or program did indeed occur in the field. So. Uh, we are very accurate today uh, at uh, being able to identify biomass uh, in the field um, in the form of cover crops. Um, we, we are working to improve um, uh, being able to detect, uh, detect tillage events. Um, and today, that's it's uh, uh, fairly accurate. I think that we could get into the 90s as well with uh, additional improvements to some of the remote sensing. So that's an example of how we are helping to drive down the cost of, uh, of MRV. Uh, and make sure that the value of these programs stays in the hands of the farmer, not in, in uh, verification and validation. So uh, with that, uh, I think uh, it is to Shelby. Yeah. Hey, thanks all for having me. Uh, so here's an overview of our environmental standards. And I'll start by saying that these um, you know, standards that underpin the fund are intended to be rigorous, but flexible. Uh, we, we all know that there are endless variations on management programs that a farmer might be running. So we want to respect that while also being able to reward high performers. So to give a cute, quick overview, um, for the first point, this criteria as it stands now applies to rotations that include corn, soy, and wheat. Um, we know that there are, you know, various mutations of that as well. Um, and there's a possibility to include additional crops uh, in the near future. Uh, on the second point, uh, soil sampling, as Steele mentioned, um, that's a fairly standard practice um, just to ensure that that is happening. Uh, on the third point, the goal here is to promote practices that have soil health benefits. So this can be achieved in various ways. It's up to the farmer to decide what works. Uh, as long as the soil is minimally disturbed or has live roots for a certain percentage of the year to help keep the soil in place. Uh, and then finally on number four, uh, this is a nutrient efficiency target that's based on nitrogen balance or as we call it N balance. Uh, and this standard helps ensure that farmers are optimizing productivity and yield while minimizing nitrogen losses to the environment. Uh, so I'll go into that in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So here we have nitrogen balance, which is a simple mass balance approach that has been advanced by our EDF scientists. Uh, and the challenge here has been is that historically nitrogen pollution is difficult to measure. Right, and if you, if you can't measure it, it's almost impossible to manage it. So nitrogen balance solves that issue. So if we're looking at these little, at this uh, equation, graphical equation, we start with considering nitrogen that's added to the field. And so this can be fertilizer, manure, legumes, any nitrogen that is an input. 
Uh, and then we subtract the nitrogen that's removed from the field at harvest, so that's grain or stover. And then the remainder or the balance is what we call nitrogen balance. And that's a nitrogen balance score that can be done on a field by field level. So any nitrogen that is remaining on the field that has not been utilized by the crop, we know is vulnerable to loss to the air and water, which can cause negative environmental impacts as we're all aware. So we love this approach because it is so simple yet scientifically robust. It's grounded in the reality of farming and it enables farmers to measure their own progress with the data that they have easy access to what, you know, for example, that they've uploaded to FBN's platform already. So the end balance score in itself is a very useful metric for what's going on in any given field. Um, but we've taken it a step further with our empirical models that convert these end balance scores into environmental outcomes. And then these outcomes, when considered across watersheds or sourcing regions or whatever the scale of interest may be, can measure the year over year performance of participants in a specific program, such as this one. So here's where the, the nerdy soil scientist in me gets excited. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see a graph that illustrates this relationship between nitrogen balance and nitrogen losses to the air and water. So EDF has worked collabor collaboratively with um, universities and institutions and various partners uh, to identify that there is a strong relationship between end balance, which is on the x axis here, and both nitrous oxide and nitrate leaching which we can lump together here to call end losses uh, on the y-axis. And this relationship is remarkably tight and it's replicable and it's robust. And we have a handful of peer reviewed publications that support that. But what you're seeing on this graph is uh, between the dotted line, the dotted yellow lines is a safe zone. And that's where we would like to see farmers um, keep their end balance scores. And that's that sweet spot, like I mentioned, where they're optimizing yields, protecting their long-term soil health, and reducing negative environmental impacts. And from the data that we've collected through our own other pilot projects and various partnerships, um, we've seen that farmers who are in this safe zone um, can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by up to 15% and their water quality impacts by about 17%. So as this pilot scales up, you know, the, the overall impact of rewarding farmers for staying in that safe zone uh, could be very meaningful from an environmental perspective. Um, so yeah, that's exciting stuff. So I will pass it back to Steele to wrap it up. Sorry, I'm uh, struggling with internet a little bit here. Um, so uh, the scale portion is really important to uh, what we are trying to do here. Um, the test of 25 million in the, in the pilot uh, is designed to do a couple of things. Uh, one, it is designed to uh, show the demand uh, from the grower side for products like this. Uh, and I can tell you we're, we're early days uh, in this program, but uh, again, we, we do expect to um, uh, run through our, our commitment here and have a, a fairly extensive waiting list um, that uh, really does demonstrate uh, substantial interest in these, in these programs. Um, the, the second component is that uh, we really uh, have two um, uh, paths to scale that we think are, are worth uh, testing and understanding. And, and one is uh, understanding the uh, fundamental risk profile of growers who adopt regenerative practices. Uh, this program, uh, it's, it's uh, likely uh, to be able to scale uh, much more beyond, um, uh, you know, 500 million in a, in a short amount of time, if it is truly a uh, credit um, uh, uh, indicator uh, that growers have deploy these practices or they actually um, less um, uh, risk in terms of uh, their, their uh, ability to pay back um, based on the resiliency of, of their crops and their programming. Um, if that's true, uh, we have a, uh, an extremely uh, interesting, exciting, scalable product. Uh, 
the second uh, component of, of what scale would look like is um, we have seen uh, substantial interest from uh, financial markets in being able to uh, have access to growers who have uh, verifiable um, uh, reductions in, in impact um, as compared to uh, either their peers or, or uh, improvements over time. And so to be able to provide the connective tissue uh, between growers who are um, fundamentally uh, better and have worked to, uh, to deploy these practices uh, to financiers that uh, care about that uh, and have growing demand for uh, what is, you know, a, a really uh, perhaps one of the most granular um, uh, explorations of, of land management uh, that, that exists, um, that we also expect to be able to scale. Uh, finally, I will say that um, the expectation here from FBN side is uh, to be able to create uh, incentives, not, not only on, on the financing side, but also through uh, the opportunity to market uh, claims through um, uh, the grain that's actually sold into the uh, uh, to uh, end buyers or, or uh, um, end market uses uh, that have uh, environmental attributes associated with them as well. Um, so to be able to align um, a, a financial incentive or a financing incentive with uh, potential uh, market uh, premiums um, start to be a really um, a virtuous cycle in which growers can uh, truly make conservation decisions at the same time that they are making business decisions, as opposed to making them in, in separate silos, uh, bringing them top of mind uh, and adding to the um, clarity and credibility of, of success uh, of what uh, deployment of uh, soil health practices um, uh, uh, can be um, in, in uh, uh, growing a pro crop. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pause and, and turn that to Maggie. Thanks, Steele. Um, so, you know, to close out, we're really excited about this opportunity to, um, you know, have an agricultural loan fund that can quantify actual environmental impacts um, and also, you know, measure the financial performance of the fund. Um, and we think that that's really key to unlocking financing for climate smart agriculture at scale, as Steele mentioned. Um, so to reiterate some of the questions that this pilot year will explore, and I'm sure there'll be many more that we can dig into as well. You know, one, just understanding how compelling this incentive is for farmers to participate. Uh, two, quantifying those environmental impacts, and we'll be able to compare them to other farmer reference groups um, and large data sets that we have to show that, you know, farmers that are staying within the end balance safe zone are in fact, you know, lower emitting than um, other groups of farmers. Um, and then being able to look closely at the financial performance of the fund. Um, and as Steele said, hopefully make the case that uh, this is a lower risk fund and a great opportunity for investment. Um, and so I think, you know, in addition to opportunities to invest directly in this project, there's also great opportunities for the broader ag finance sector to learn. Um, you know, as agricultural, agricultural lenders around the world are trying to assess the risk to their farmer, farmer clients from climate change um, and risks to their loan portfolios, um, trying to assess the greenhouse gas emissions inherent in those portfolios. And then on the flip side, really trying to uncover opportunities to finance um, low emissions agriculture. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot from this, and we're very excited to share that with you uh, as we do. So um, that's the end of our presentation. Um, to learn more about this or follow our work, please do um, check out EDF's Agriculture Finance Resources Hub. We've got um, all of our previous reports, blogs, and other resources. Um, this webinar recording will be up there. Um, and so please do check that out. And then I also wanted to add a plug to for the webinar um, on the Field to Market report um, that's next week. And so that, that link um, will take you to that registration page. Um, so I will leave this up for just a second in case anybody's uh, copying down websites while I take a look at these questions um, and start dishing them out. Okay. Um, so the first one is on the farm profitability slide. Um, what was the demographics of those surveyed, i.e. I, those on board or those that have not adopted practices? So I think that's, uh, that, that is referring to our banking on uh, soil health report, um, which we released um, last year. 
And you can also find that on our Agriculture Resources Hub. Um, that report uh, looked at uh, survey results from 100 Iowa farmers and intentionally we were trying to get beyond our bubble of our farmer friends um, to you know a representative sample of all uh, Iowa farmers who were 500 acres or uh, or above. Um, so that is not just conservation adopters that is a representative sample of Iowa farmers um, and we were really uh, excited to see the enthusiasm for um, conservation in that group. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, um, here's a question about, um, more about, uh, that I'll give to you, Shelby, that's um, getting at um, more of a life cycle analysis question around um, fertilizer use. use. So it says, you know, in your environmental calculations, why are you not including synthetic chemical manufacture, transport application, et cetera? Um, can you say a little bit more about um, kind of what's in and what's out in end balance? Sure, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and we made the decision to just focus on the nitrogen inputs at the field or farm level, um, knowing that of course there's all these other factors that are influencing it, um, but that's, we have a better point of leverage to incentivize the farmer's behavior themselves with this kind of um, fund rather than the rest of it. So we could look at it that way. You know, if we go through the pilot and we say, oh, we, we can add in those numbers and take a look and see what it would look like. Um, but that's just kind of, kind of, it's a little outside of the scope of what we think that this fund can accomplish with changing and incentivizing farmer behavior. Thanks, Shelby. Um, Steele, a question for you. Um, how do you control farmers staying in the safe zone? Many farmers apply nitrogen only a few times a year and can't always control how much nitrogen removal there is at the end of the season. What happens if they fall outside of the zone, even if they're doing all the right things? Yeah, so there's a couple of interesting components to that. Um, one, we are not uh, controlling growers uh, really in the sense of uh, being punitive. So um, the way that the uh, fund is structured is uh, we ha have a rebate uh, for being able to hit the environmental uh, protocol. And so uh, we go through and do a, an analysis uh, with the grower to help them uh, understand what the protocol is, uh, how they uh, would uh, qualify for it, uh, and then what uh, potential things could happen during the season that would be difficult uh, for them. Um, it is a three-year uh, average, and so that helps to um, even out uh, any uh, one season's um, uh, um, you know, problems, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, but even given that, uh, I think that there are uh, certainly examples of growers being uh, having extremely uh, good intent, uh, being you know qualifying uh, every other year and having you know things that uh, would would disqualify them for for any number of reasons. And so um, the the expectation in, in that uh, instance again is to be able to uh, keep high credibility within the um, within the program within hitting the uh, protocols, uh, but not to be punitive. And so um, on a case by case basis, we will uh, review uh, growers who uh, believe that they uh, should or have uh, hit the, um, uh, the evaluation and, and uh, be able to uh, make uh, independent decisions on, on whether they would still qualify for a rebate in a given year, uh, even if they don't uh, hit the protocol as stated. So uh, again, that is, uh, we would expect for that to be uh, uh, the exception and not the rule, um, and that most growers that we do admit it to the program uh, are going to be able to uh, hit that protocol on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Steele. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, here's a good question. Another question for you, your, you Steele. Um, does participation restrict a grower's ability to sell carbon credits to other markets? Yeah, uh, so uh, it's a really, really good question about who owns the claims and, and uh, the transportability of those claims. So uh, for participation uh, in this uh, fund, uh, you are not assigning the exclusive right to make claims about this to, uh, to FBN or to certainly to EDF or to, the, uh, to any financier involved. Um, uh, that is really important to us uh, because uh, we uh, believe that uh, particularly when you are making 
uh, any kind of uh, scope three improvements. Uh, it is owned by the entire supply chain. It's very difficult to assign it to uh, an individual actor within the supply chain um, and have it really still function as a as a working supply chain. So um, this has been explicitly designed to be able to stack on top of um, crop insurance programs, to stack on top of watershed programs, to stack on top of a carbon credit program. So uh, great question, and, and you would not find uh, a problem with us. I would encourage you, however, to review um, your own contract, uh, as always, for um, who does own those, those uh, claims uh, for your carbon credit program. Um, we, we, FBN runs its own uh, small program on, on carbon offsets. I can tell you that we have reviewed a number of other contracts and those things are complex uh, and the rights that you are signing away about environmental claims are real. And so uh, I would, I would heavily encourage uh, any, any growers that are looking at signing, you know, multi-year uh, contracts like that uh, to know what their rights are and, and to know um, what they are, are signing away from those uh, carbon programs. Thank you. Um, another one for you, Seal. Um, what are your expectations for average loan size, drawdowns, and repayment? Um, and also, what risks were most difficult to overcome in deciding to roll out this innovation? Yeah, um, there's a couple of pieces there. Uh, average loan size will probably be between um, four to six hundred thousand uh, dollars. Um, uh, we've seen everything from uh, fifty, which just the minimum up to, uh, I believe we're, uh, we have a couple that are in the uh, million to the design of this is to be accessible to uh, as many different um, uh, growers. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think uh, I might be getting disconnected a little bit. Um, let me repeat We're myself back. one second. <laughs> Uh, the design of the loan, um, again, within the within the context of what could be supported by imbalance and the, and the cropping patterns, is that we did not want to uh, have this skewed towards uh, large farms exclusively. Uh, we want it to be accessible to really whatever size farm. Um, and and as we expand the number of crops, that will you'll see us uh, invest a lot more in that as well. Uh, we do see this as somewhat of a a, a program that can help um, uh, growers of all shapes and sizes. So. Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, the answer to the first question or the first part of the question. Um, in terms of risks, uh, I think that there is, uh, there are a, a couple. Um, for one, uh, and, and this is kind of my side of the business, uh, launching environmental programs, but um, there is a uh, a tone to take. Um, and uh, I think in, environmental programs have not always done this very well, where it can be paternalistic, uh, where it can say, um, you know, do the right thing, because before you were doing the wrong thing. And um, we, we uh, feel very strongly, in fact, that the this program is designed to raise up and highlight growers who have pioneered these practices. Um, but it doesn't always mean that it's communicated or understood in those in those terms. So uh, I think uh, when we when we a, a good example of of um, uh, challenges that we've had in the past is uh, 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 general um, skepticism from the uh, uh, grower community about uh, you know is this just another. Uh, a, program or a way to, um, uh, you know, regulations are going to come in and look at, you know, look at my farm. And I think that those questions are very fair. Um, and this has been, it's our job to communicate why this is explicitly the opposite, um, why this is opt-in, uh, why this is voluntary, uh, and why we think that it is a good deal for growers, but not uh, something that we would ever expect that would be uh, mandatory or, or punitive. Thank you. Um... There's a question here about um, the OCC's uh, climate supervision principles, um, which I can't really say specifically on that, but I can say uh, with regard to the broader question of financial regulation, um, certainly we see an increased trend um, in financial regulation to look at climate risk and disclosure. Um, and, you know, right now that's more in uh, intensive sectors like oil and gas, but I think agriculture is on the horizon. And so it really behooves, you know, folks in the agriculture sector to start thinking about, you know, what does effective climate risk measurement, disclosure and mitigation look like for them? Um, I think tools, uh, you know, products like this are, are one tool in the toolkit. There will also need to be 
uh, you know, better ways to measure the greenhouse gases of full loan portfolios, um, better ways to assess both, both physical and transition uh, climate risks to producers and to lenders. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a, a wide swath of, of action that is being driven, you know, by financial regulators, um, but also by, um, you know, movement that we see in food and ag agriculture supply chains, you know, pushing for increased sustainability. So, you know, this isn't something that's being driven by just one factor. There are multiple different um, factors that are, you know, pushing uh, the financial sector in this direction. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, Shelby, here's one for you. Um, could you again just summarize quickly um, the climate and water quality benchmarks um, and the information farmers have to provide uh, to show that they're meeting those benchmarks? Yeah, sure. So this, this safe zone, um, which has an upper bound of 75 pounds of nitrogen per acre and a lower bound of 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre, is what we consider to be what, what you were referring to, I think, is the benchmarks. And so these uh, numbers or these bounds hold you know, across all different cropping types and zones and soils and everything. We know that once you get beyond 75, your risk of losses uh, start to increase dramatically. Um, so those are the numbers that we like to, to keep an eye on. And between there, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room, um, but those are, those are the numbers. And so to get to that number again, we try to keep it as simple as possible. So it's just nitrogen into a field um, subtracted by nitrogen removed from the field. And then that's your score that determines where you fall within or above or below that zone. Thank you. Yes, it's really the nitrogen balance quantification that drives both our uh, calculation of the greenhouse gas impact uh, in the form of nitrous oxide and the water quality impact uh, in the form of nitrates. Um, Steele, I'll give this one to you. Are you partnering with any other private sponsors or is this the only two organizations collaboration? Is this a grant funded initiative with a given time frame for exit? Yeah, uh, I really appreciate the question. Um, so FBN is uh, uh, the way our um, uh, finance arm is structured is that we are a, uh, we originate and we service loans um, and those loans are uh, backed by um, uh, large financial institutions. So um, that does not come uh, from our balance sheet. We are um, uh, kind of uh, assisting in, in uh, generating those loans. Um, the discount in this uh, regard was uh, funded internally I buy FBN. Uh, we had a, a number of uh, interested parties um, to uh, take on uh, the whole thing, and uh, we opted to do it ourselves uh, in order for uh, expediency. Uh, we wanted to be able to get uh, this pilot in in, um, uh, in market uh, this year for the operating loan season, uh, so that we would be able to expand uh, for for later um, this year. Um, so. Uh, in the future, again, I think that there are a couple of uh, expectations about uh, scale here, um, and uh, one of them would be uh, the, the change in, in time frame, or excuse me, the, the length of the loan. Uh, that is really important to us to be able to provide some continuity uh, to growers uh, as they uh, get into these uh, programs. Uh, but then uh, as well, uh, we would, we would uh, uh, the uh, discount would be funded uh, by the market in the future. Uh, and that is uh, fully the expectation for, um, for, for scale and growth of this program. And um, here's another question for you, Steele, from what looks like a grower who's maybe weighing, you know, his current loan with his current lender versus this opportunity. And so can you say a little bit about what, um, perhaps both like what the typical rates are for an FBN operating loan um, and also how much work it takes to input uh, data. Yeah, um, so two components. One is your, um, your, uh, your credit check, uh, essentially. Um, we have recently automated that. Um, so I think the average turnaround on a, um, the, uh, your application is about um, 15 minutes now. Um, to go from um, just entering uh, your information about uh, your loan application to um, a an approval um, uh, notification. So uh, we had we had a farmer a couple of weeks ago uh, tell us that they thought that they filled out a uh, they were interested in applying for a loan and they thought they had filled out a 
uh, lead generation form uh, when in fact they had filled out the loan application form and they had already been approved before they <laughs> before they even knew. So it is it is that uh, painless and that uh, speedy. Um, from the environmental protocol standpoint, um, again, typically we take about 20 minutes. Um, most of that is dependent on uh, where your uh, uh, where where the level of a, a grower's record keeping. Uh, we are absolutely happy to spend uh, more time uh, to help a grower uh, organize his or her uh, records and, and thoughts around uh, if they would be uh, able to meet uh, those requirements. But uh, typically, they have been about 15 or 20 minutes walking through your uh, fertilization program, uh, walking through the soil health uh, practices that you uh, either have deployed or are planning to deploy. Um, and it, it is relatively painless as well. Um, so I do understand and appreciate that um, this is uh, more work uh, and more effort than uh, another uh, type of loan, um, but uh, we believe that the uh, discount and the opportunity to highlight uh, what you're doing uh, is uh, an important one, and, and uh, uh, there the, the data um, uh, contribution really uh, it allows for us to be confident to, uh, about the, the grower's ability to hit that protocol. Great. Um, that's one that, that I'll take, but Steele, you might have thoughts on this as well. Um, so any thoughts on how loans slash rebates can be structured optimally to best support farmers in their initiatives? Um, and here I would say right now is a time of great interest and experimentation in this space. And there are a variety of different pilots ongoing right now or getting kicked off like this one, testing different methods to support producers in different ways. So, you know, if, you, if um, we link back to that field to market report that was um, released earlier this week that had, you know, 12 different approaches to this challenge. And really we tried to ground people in asking themselves, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, is this a risk sharing problem? Is this something else? Um, I mean, in our case, we really wanted to focus in on the data and focus in on farmers being rewarded for you know, the recognition of the risk reduction benefits of these practices. And if you hit the environmental benchmark, you get the incentive. Um, there are other approaches, like in our previous work on banking on soil health, we focused more on um, a hypothetical loan product that was modeled off of an organic transition product, where it's more like following the producer through their transition year by year and structured to their change. Um, I think, you know, that's also a viable option that will work for some growers. So, you know, really, I think the, the best thing to do right now is to get a few different things out into the marketplace and have farmers actually interact with them and see what works well for them. Um, Steele, do you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is what I think I get uh, most excited about is the idea that um, this is one of what we think could be a stable of uh, 10 to 20 different products. Um, it's an operating line. It's one year. We would like to be able to experiment, as I said, with um, a, a longer uh, ten tenure. Um, we would like to be uh, bringing this to equipment loans, uh, which are you know very directly tied with growers who are thinking about making changes to, to practices, changes to equipment, um, and land loans uh, to be able to help growers uh, be able to you know, um, uh, bring on uh, more land and, and manage more land. Uh, we're also, uh, we have launched a um, uh, programs to help get growers uh, more land on the equity side as well, um, be able to uh, change balance sheets um, and uh, uh, away from a pure debt to some equity um, in, in being able to invest in more land. So uh, I think that we're quite interested in experimenting and trying uh, and understanding more about uh, how we can uh, connect growers with uh, uh, um, uh, financial demand for um, the environmental friendly practices that they either have or could have and in a, in a, um, a wide uh, variety of ways. Um, and, and we have just begun to scratch the surface here. So uh, quite a bit uh, in the future. Um, one question, Steele, that I'm not sure if we can answer, we might need to uh, get somebody from your finance team on this. Um, but they asked, what is uh, the analysis that we perform to determine a proper loan size for a producer? Uh, yeah, I would I would uh, want to bring somebody in um, that's actually responsible for uh, reviewing the the uh, credit applications. But um, my expectation is that um, the 
well, I, I won't speculate, but I, I believe it is um, the number is is uh, specified by the grower. It's not uh, assigned by us. So um, that would be my guess, but I, we can certainly follow up on that. Yeah, feel free to email me and I can get you connected um, to look into that more. Um, Shelby, for you, are you collecting tissue samples to help monitor nitrogen? Uh, we are not. We have looked at some of that data uh, when we were in the process of calibrating that curve um, to make sure that everything lines up uh, the way that it does. Um, and so when we are calculating the nitrogen removed from a field for a farmer, we use book values. We use the IPNI um, book value for grain content. Uh, if a farmer is testing their grain or their um, tissue samples, you know, that's fine. They can report that and um, you know, we won't stop them. But um, we don't really feel like that's a necessary step to end up at an accurate and balanced score and environmental outcome number. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, this is definitely a, a question for Shelby, but I, I would like to layer in that um, uh, there was quite a bit of work uh, that went into balancing um, the amount of information that could be gathered uh, to the claims that you know could be made. And um, the, the decisions and the, in, in what you see uh, from the EDF protocol uh, were not made lightly. It was really weighing uh, the burden to the grower, the scalability of the program, and the importance of uh, being able to, uh, again, credibly and, and knowledgeably make claims about environmental uh, impact and, and potential improvements. And so um, it's not that uh, taking tissue samples is not important. Um, and, I, and I think uh, being able to continue to uh, uh, maybe at least from the FBN standpoint, uh, uh, build models in a in a way that we really understand nitrogen cycles uh, in in the field is is going to be crucially important. But um, we have been grateful and appreciative of FBN or of EDF's approach to uh, be farmer friendly um, in in this process as well. Great. Well, that's all of our questions. Um, so please do reach out if you have any other questions or want to learn more. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for hosting us, Maggie.